uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on what part of the continent you're in. Uh, welcome to another Nurse Ideas in Motion uh, virtual roundtables. Uh, this is uh, what I've dubbed uh, part two of assessment roundtable uh, for today. Uh, I'll go start off with introductions. My name is Chris Washington. I'm the coordinator of student development and engagement at UNC Charlotte University Recreation. Um, and then with me, I have two Jasons for the nurse assessment, research and assessment uh, committee uh, for us today. So you wanna introduce yourselves? Sure, I'm uh, Jason Vlasteris, Associate Director for Student Success and Programs with uh, Iowa State University. Hi everyone, Jason Miller, University of Pittsburgh, Assistant Director of Campus Recreation and um, also current chair with the Research and Assessment Committee for NURSA. Um, thank y'all for, uh, again, doing this round table with me. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you guys can get, um, for our audience, um, and our uh, contributors, we can get uh, a lot of things going on with the assessment, especially, you know, since the part one, um, way back in May, hopefully there's some things that change or any things that we want to contribute, uh, for as new topics throughout what has been going on, um, regarding COVID and other things. Um, so just uh, general minors and guidelines. Uh, again, this is, of course, like any other uh, roundtable, this will be uh, recorded and posted on the nurse website. So if you have colleagues or anyone that is not able to attend um, this one, it will be definitely on the website for um, after login um, viewing. Uh, please make sure, you guys, if you're not uh, contributing, make sure everything's muted so other people have a chance to get their full thoughts and ideas on the table. Uh, use the chat box, of course, to uh, ask any questions or anything that you have to contribute and, um, you know, as an educational session together. And then we all welcome all ideas and suggestions. We are not all the masters of assessment as that is a ever changing field and growing day by day. So if you have anything to suggest or any ideas, uh, please feel free to share. Sounds good. So let's, uh, so we, uh, we asked the nursing community uh, as, uh, on different topics of discussion for this round table um, on what's going on and anything they want to cover. So these are the ones that we want to cover to, uh, that we were going to cover today. And if we have time to cover any other ideas that people want to share, we can. Um, but the topic of discussion is effects of student engagement experiences through alterations in competitive sports. So we know that, you know, there's a possibility that competitive sports, intramurals, and sport clubs might be uh, shut down? And how does that affect students? What types of assessment um, are people doing in regards to, you know, the possible effects that competitive sports may or may not happen? Um, we talk about assessment of programs during COVID, outcome-based or numbers-based. So maybe uh, for those of you who are doing more virtual programming during COVID, um, what type of track you have taken, whether or not you're looking more on outcomes of how students are being engaged or mental health, or are you looking more so at the numbers or trying to get as much participation uh, for assessment and telling the story in regards to that matter. Um, using assessment practice to advance the equity within recreation. So of course, this has become a more um, important topic, you know, through the recent uh, social injustice issues that have been going on in our country. Um, so touching on a little bit uh, with using assessment practice to um, tell the full story and make sure that we not only tell the story for one end, but the other, the full story for all other ends. And then uh, assessment of marginalized groups within recreation. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, into what I have been seeing through um, our participation data at our institution and look to see if any of you have been doing um, fairly similar uh, assessment research in regards to that. So um uh, wanted to go through and see if anyone had any ideas jason you can feel free to start um on any effects that you guys have looked at with, with student engagement experiences um from changes to competitive sports Anybody have anything? 
Anything to add right now with that? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll speak on behalf of um, Pitt. We, we haven't really done any um, assessment on the engagement piece. So th this area I was really kind of interested in the, in the group of participants on um, what you may have done in terms of engaging your um, students that are involved in club sports, you know, during this time, um, and also what that might look like moving forward. So for me, it's kind of a big question mark, but I'm really interested to hear what the, you know, what the membership has. Uh, this is uh, Mike Dominguez from Sonoma State. I'm I'm curious. In, in California, we've we've shut down pretty much for the fall, and I don't know if our students are interested in, in reaching out or doing much, or if we're reaching out too much and and they're getting kind of overwhelmed with everything. So I'm kind of in that middle point where I'm not sure how much is is needed from students, or if we're, we're doing too much right now and they're just overwhelmed with things. I think that's a topic that we should probably hit on broadly um, at some point is that's and I think that topic is a through line for some of these other things that were brought up about assessing during COVID and that's a, a fine line we were trying to <clears throat> ride before COVID as well is kind of the overburdening and surveying of our students and, and putting into some place those practices so I would also like to hear additionally I guess I'm also putting in that way from other people if they are seeing similar things um, and maybe more specific to sport clubs. I was curious, uh, right now at our institution right now, um, our assistant director for sport clubs has been doing much more meetings um, with the sport club officers um, and looking towards um, what, I guess, is from a, because we're, we're trying to implement a strength and conditioning program, but what uh, alternative programs are we, are they comfortable with while they may or may not have to travel um, just to help them stay in, within the rounds of sport clubs? So they, she's been having monthly meetings. Um, so far, they've liked it to stay engaged but obviously as everyone said um we don't want to pull too much so she's been doing once a month um to get that started um and it's it seems to uh been working out for her um throughout this time so and during this downtime it might be a good um idea from a sport club angle to start doing some reflections and assessments with the students who are in those sport clubs to, you know, as a high impact practice, um, the skill development that occurs from holding some of those positions or just being involved in an organized student club and more specifically a sport club. So are there kind of those assessments out there that we can do now that, and historically too, we've also looked at things from a recruitment and retention standpoint. You know, we have self-report data from students that talk about how, um, that sport club experience in particular was a big driver for them either staying at the university or coming to the university. Um, so now that we, you know, kind of getting back to that balance of, of asking or doing too much during that time, it could give an opportunity to um, start measuring some of those things with the, the sport club athletes. Yeah. You know, no, another thing that I'll add, um, and again, I don't know how, how closely this this connects to the um, from an assessment standpoint, but at the beginning of each year, like many institutions, we'll do a club sport activities fair, um, and we most recently we've we've kind of uh, connected that to a campus rec initiative that we do. It's like a campus wide event. We call it Recomania. So um, obviously, we're not doing the the Recomania at the beginning of the school year, um, and really, all of our student. Um, welcome week or orientation activities are going to be online. Uh, they'll be virtual. And so with that, the, the club sport activities piece is going to be virtual. So um, obviously we don't have any data uh, or, you know, um, feedback on that yet, but I'm, I'm interested to see how that's received by the students. Um, and from both ends, the, the, the clubs themselves, and obviously they rely on recruiting um, new students and you know, sharing information about their club, but then also 
the, the new students that are coming on campus looking for those opportunities. So um, I think there's a number of things that are connected to that in terms of, um, you know, how are we engaging these first year students as they come on campus? Are these clubs going to be impacted in terms of their roster numbers because um, they may be affected on, you know, how many students actually are learning about their clubs and, and, um, and signing up. So uh, again, a question for the group, but what, um, what has your traditional um, recruitment look, looked like on campus and is that changing for this coming year? And do you share, you know, similar concerns or questions? Jason, is that with, uh, in terms of recruitment today, um, or uh, are you just saying general overall? Yeah, I think it, you know, from, from now moving forward, you know, and um, again, I, I, we do this massive activities fair on campus um, at the beginning of every year. You know, every single student organization has an opportunity to um, to participate um, in the in the past, we've taken our basketball arena and they ran out the the main gymnasium and they set up all the tables and you know all the students know that if, if you're looking for things to do, that's where you go. So now that's all going to be shifted to the virtual space, um, and even the way that they're structuring things, I think is pretty interesting because like in Zoom, you can do breakout rooms. So I think what they're planning on doing is is having um, and I don't know how, how this is going to work logistically, but if you're interested in attending the activities fair, you go to this virtual activities fair, and then there'll be um, different rooms that you can break out into. So if I want to go learn about, you know, this particular club, then they'll have some, I guess, office hours, if you will. You can go and meet with those, those clubs online, and you can ask questions and learn about them. Um, so again, from like an engagement piece, um, I, I think the idea is there. It makes sense. I, I just really, I'm really interested to see like what those participation numbers are like. And then from a club standpoint, do they get the level of interest that they typically do, um, you know, when they have these traditional activities fairs? I think from the, I can speak for the more so of um, the general activities, not necessarily sport clubs. Uh, when when we do do presentations or the virtual boardroom programs, uh, we're starting to receive normally from time to time, not county, obviously the host or the panelists, uh, we see normally between six to 10 participants per, and they will probably do, I would say 10 to 15 different sessions throughout, I guess this quote unquote orientation period, um, where um, unfortunately a lot of questions we do get is on sport clubs. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, is you have soccer instrumentals, but do you have a sport club? Do you, um, is lacrosse a sport club? Is this is sport club. So we do get a lot of sport club questions um, and activities and we engage to that. Um, however, we, I don't think for our university, we have looked into as of right now, uh, any like sport club specific, you know, breaking out sessions. Um, our institutions kind of kept that on under wraps right now because we don't know obviously what's going on. So I think that's a good point, Chris, because um, again, we're, we're this can can connect to the engagement piece, but that there's there's a lot of just what ifs right now, and and so I think one of the discussions that we're having um, as a department is really with regard to the governing bodies of these different clubs, and um, how is it going to look? Um, let's say when the when the semester kicks off and we've got maybe some governing bodies that have their ducks in a row, um, or maybe it's a lower contact sport that would allow for that, that activity to take place. 
Whereas other sports that are higher contact and maybe the governing bodies are, you know, uh, managing their risk differently. So how does that look for us as, uh, as a department where you've got some club sports that can operate and, and others that can't? Um, and then also, you know, even just the governing bodies aside, if you have certain, act, certain clubs that um, based on the state guidelines or the university guidelines, maybe they can practice um, because they meet that criteria, but then other clubs can't because, um, you know, be, because it's, the risk is just too much to assume at this point. So like, I'll give you the example of um, not even the traditional sports, but like the, the mat type sports. So like karate, MMA, judo, you know, we've got probably 10 or so different um, mat based sports that we're just not even really comfortable right now um, managing that space just, just because of the skin, you know, contact on the mats. So it's something that we're, um, you know, we're constantly just thinking about and, and talking about. And uh, if I had to put my money on it right now, I would say that we're probably going to have to just handle each club as, you know, as its own. And it, it might look, it might look a little bit awkward where some we're just going to have to kind of put on pause or maybe if they want to practice, they're going to have to practice with, you know, some sort of limited capacity. Maybe they can't do full contact, but maybe they can do certain types of activities. Um, but at least for, for what I'm seeing, it, it looks like we're not going to be able to um, do all sports full fledged starting in the fall. It's just going to have to be kind of a graduated, um, you know, scale for, for each sport, um, depending on, you know, what those guidelines are. Sounds good. I'll uh, move on to the next one. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, so we've kind of, kind of mentioned this before in the last one, but we didn't really get a lot just based on, we just don't know. Um, but uh, assessment of programs during COVID. So um, over time we've done some virtual programming or alternative programming and some facilities are even open now. Um, so um, has, in regards to your approach, has any, for anyone out there um, or our panelists, has, has your assessment programs become more outcome-based or are you focusing more on the numbers uh, to generate for students? Uh, this is Stephanie Plummer from California Baptist University. Um, Christian, I'm one of the people that sent that. In discussions with a couple people, we've been talking about whether or not the shift or, or some of the shift should be to engagement as we're becoming so, um, oh, somebody said it, like virtually saturated um, that they're concerned about engagement period and then how do we assess the engagement that does happen virtually. So if people, um, sorry, I'll put my face up there. If people are um, not choosing to come in or utilizing the fact that we have additional virtual programs where we might not have had as many before, um, how do we engage learning? I don't, I don't know if that's not engaged. Like, how do we incentivize or get them to be willing to fill out an assessment because now they're at home, right? And they're not even at the program or, you know, doing a QR code at the table or whatever. Um, or should we just be counting, you know, likes and visits? Like, I, I'm just kind of confused as to what we should do. I was just looking to see if people kind of have mapped out a plan. You know, is it a hybrid plan? I just don't even know where to start with engagement versus focusing on the learning outcomes. It's a great, uh, this is a great topic. I hope we can spend some time on it because I don't think it's so, personally, I don't think it's so much an either or as much as it's an and. So some things we can have access to more than others and control around the engagement numbers themselves and the conversion rates and the clicks and what pages are they going to and 
how long are they watching our live group fitness classes and we can turn those into measurable things. I think we personally, we're not doing it yet. We're, we're going to adopt as far as the, the learning piece and the, well, really not the, the assessment piece of the actual activity. We're going to borrow um, some self-report survey structures from our um, counseling services that are doing virtual counseling sessions at the moment that are really still generally broad and, and talking about their, their overall well-being and their connection to campus through our services and things like that. And it's something simple uh, with just a few questions that will help us at least measure some of that impact and engagement, not to the level of some of the learning outcomes we're able to do potentially before, but, and that's just where we're, we're starting with at the moment is to try to ad is adapt those with really just, I would assume at this point, our, our virtual group fitness um, and personal training services is going to be our starting point. But that's where I think it's an either or. And I'd like to hear from some other people because I've heard that um, other schools are kind of creating somewhat of a top-down approach for that measurement of virtual engagement. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any insights. Go to the chat. Yeah, we got a good comment here from Aaron from, I think, Colorado State. Aaron, do you want to um, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, um, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Sorry, I've been having some technical issues and I've already dropped out off of the call once. So if you lose me, just know it's me, not you. Um, yeah, so I mean, really, we're, we're still not open. And so our focus has been so heavily on tracking numbers, um, both from like, you know, looking at that on our web and social um, and a little bit around satisfaction and to be perfectly honest that's a lot of us trying to justify that we didn't return student fees for spring semester right so I'll just be open about that um, but we we have been trying to do a little bit of capturing data around how we are still offering some sort of impact whether that's people feeling a sense of community when they join those live you know instagram workouts or you know some of the typical things that i think we believe we offer like stress relief and um, th those types of things. And so that's all really I've been doing so far as our kind of leader of assessment efforts, um, really trying to keep things short, as I think I heard early on, we, some of you were talking about like just the burnout um, and not wanting to contribute to that by asking them to fill out yet another survey. But I think as we slowly work towards fall and see like who is operating which programs, etc., cetera, um, I don't think we want to get as a department, we've been really working hard to build a culture of learning outcomes assessment and not just satisfaction. And so um, I'm gonna be encouraging our groups to really think about weaving at least one component around learning back in. Um, I don't think I want to let us get too far away from, even though just life is different and we recognize that, but I don't wanna get too far away from the learning. Um, mostly because I know that it's going to be asked of us and we still need to show that even though things have changed. Um, so it literally might just be a question on a survey, right? Like one thing, it might just be that, but I feel good if it is just one thing um, instead of nothing. So that's kind of the super casual approach I'm trying to take with our assessment plan for this year. Um, not wanting to burden our staff, but also not wanting us to, to lose data because people will still be learning. It's just going to look different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's good. Hey, guys. Um, this is April Lovett, and I work at Florida State University. Um, I don't work in collegiate recreation, but I work in the Vice President for Student Affairs Office as a assessment and strategic planning analyst. And um, I just wanted to share that our office came up with a... Um, almost like a guide to assessing virtual experiences. It's not specific to recreation, but it is pretty specific to the actual like virtual engagement experiences that everybody's trying to do right now. Um, the three things that, or the three priorities that we are asking our departments to really examine when they think about assessment with virtual engagement, um, is utilization, learning, and satisfaction. And so we have a couple guiding questions, and then we give a lot of examples of how, um, how best to do that in the virtual atmosphere. And um, it sounds like, I wasn't on the first assessment roundtable, but it sounds like from some of the discussion, 
people understand that it's hard to get students to engage anyway. Um, so if you get them on the actual like Zoom virtual programming, then it's best to try to capture the assessment then if possible and if necessary. Um, so I do have a guide. I actually created um, or put together a PDF of another guide for this particular roundtable for a little bit later that I'm going to share. Um, I didn't do it for this one, but we do have it available and I can put it together um, if people are interested in seeing like just best practice, what we've been doing and recommending for our departments in the division. So let me know if that's something of interest. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, April. I'm curious, has um, with, with that guide that the university has shared, does anyone um, within your office or throughout the institution have examples of how that assessment has gone? You know, like, do they have any data to share? Um, oh, go ahead. Um, we have not yet. Um, we are encouraging our departments to really integrate that and um, not send the numbers back to us quite yet until after the summer happens. Um, and that's just because we are, I think it kind of like Aaron said, we're trying to encourage all of the departments to take onus of their assessment um, experiences. From my standpoint in the vice president's office, I'm like one of two people that's actually working on assessment for the division. Um, and so we have a lot on our plate right now. Um, so we don't have numbers yet, but I would be very happy to share if we do start getting those, especially as we go into what we call summer C and summer C and like welcome programming for the students coming in. Um, I think that after this, and as we get closer to the fall, we should be able to have some of those examples and I can send out any information, any data we do get from that assessment. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I think that the, um, the fact that there's a, a, a guide that the institution created, that's, I think that's a wonderful tool to have because I think a lot of us are, you know, your assessment in of itself, I think is, uh, can, can be a challenging thing because you, you don't want to, um, you want data that speaks truth, right? You don't want to just fudge numbers and, and try to justify stuff. So when you add the virtual component into it, it makes it that much more challenging. And so I think having some sort of a guide, um, you know, to help walk people through that process, even though it's going to look different for each unit, um, could be immensely helpful. Yeah, and I'm very happy to share. Um, I don't know, I guess I could just send it to Chris or to um, one of the Jasons and have you guys send it out with any other resources. Yeah. Sure. Okay, cool. All right, we got a, uh, another question here from, uh, a question from Mark asking about how participation in our programs and services affects connectivity and sense of belonging with peers in the institution as a whole. That's a good one. So we, we've we actually, um, in regards to that question, we, we've done a survey a couple of times in, uh, to our student participants um, with, about sense of belonging. Um, we've kept it simple on intentionally on purpose uh to ask them whether or not they feel involved um at the institution to try to capture whether or not they have that sense of belonging because it's some students may or may not know what sense of belonging concept is so we kind of uh intentionally asked them you know do they feel connected um we've even asked that question that you know as a result of uh, participating or you know consistently being in our programs do you feel um, connected to the institution and then just, you know, flat out asking them yes or no, uh, whether or not they, they do. And so far we've actually got more responses than, you know, obviously the typical survey question on, yeah, I strongly agree, or it's just either you do or you don't. And so a, the sense of blowing question, we kept pretty intentional. We've got some good responses in regards to that. Yeah, we've done something similar and asked it in a couple different ways as well, still in a, in a very simple format, but connection back to the campus community as a result of this activity or sense of belongingness. So 
Um, we send out a, a semester by semester participation or satisfaction survey to facility members where this question gets added and we're starting to add it to some of our program areas as well. Um, but along with that, we also ask um, to try to get some self-report data on uh, participants' uh, perception of benefits of the different dimensions of wellness that we ascribe to. So we asked about the different dimensions of wellness and how they feel that um, they've received or gained benefit um, from participating in that activity or using our services. So that also helps uh, paint another picture for us. Hmm, that's good, Mark. Yeah, our, um, we don't do a survey per se on the sense of belonging. Um, but we've had some really interesting interactions on our social media during this time. And um, our marketing efforts are unique in that we're, it's a small team and it's primarily run by um, student workers. And um, when we first kind of hit this, uh, this COVID phase and everyone was going crazy about doing the virtual programming, you know, a lot of these questions about engagement and you know uh, expanding your programming and everything came up and my one student worker in particular made a really good comment about the the power that um social media can have and not not in terms of delivering programming and, and advertising programmings but helping students maintain a sense of community and so the way that he it described it to me is um obviously when they're on campus that's their community they connect with each other in person and they have their you know their their circle of friends and everything. And then whenever, um, whenever we close campus, that, that essentially is, is kind of, you know, ripped away from them. Um, and they stay connected through their own means of texting and, and social and whatnot. But basically the, the, the call that he put on us was as a unit, um, campus recreation is something that they look forward to uh, while they're on campus. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, probably one of the most important components to their student life experience. Um, and we can do that. We can still maintain that sense of community through our social, um, through our social interactions. And so it's just been interesting for us to pay attention to, especially on Instagram. Um, our, our following has just continued to, it, to grow. And, and that's partly due to the, I think the strategies that our, our marketing team has been doing. Um, but we're also seeing, um, and I'll say engagement in terms of like the data that, that the social media, you know, dashboard can provide, but we're seeing higher engagement through our social. Um, and I think it's, I think that that's partly due to the connection that campus recreation provides. And so for, for us, at least, um, we, we really kind of took a step back from adding more virtual programming to let's focus on the stuff that we know that, that students are responding to. And in, the, in, our, in our case, it was through Instagram and some of the fun um, you know, social media posts and, and stories and whatnot that we put out there. So um, kind of going back to that whole question initially that someone presented about sense of belonging, I think that we can even probably justify that through data with the, the posts that we've done over this, over this summer. Um, and again, just like the, the positive response that we've gotten from students and, um, you know, they still feel connected to us in some way, even though they're not on campus. Yeah, and I'm trying to think about how to frame this, but I mean, yeah. we, we got a lot of information from starting internally with our student employees where we started a, a canvas online course for them to be able to to earn hours and it created a lot of content because one of the activities we had them do is to fill out um, a grid of a COVID-19 action plan uh, that the student wellness department had created and so we found that coming through kind of those qualitative responses and coming up with themes the students were writing things in there about how they were planning on engaging and creating community uh, with their peers um, virtually um, in ways that I had never, we had never really thought about, you know, virtual cooking classes, getting together and talking while playing this video game or doing X thing. So that was almost turned into a little bit of a, 
I don't know, a needs assessment in some way for us to look back at that data just from the student employee perspective to get a gauge on how they're actually really building community and how we can adopt some of those practices or just empower what they're already doing in some ways. That's a really good point. Anyone else? Can you share with that? Oh, Mark, you have anything to add to it? Sure. Yeah, I just, you know, the intentionality of belonging is, you know, kind of a passion project of mine, but I, I kind of can't, quick, quick stories. I, I go to a community center with my family and they do activities on Easter or, you know, like that where we bring the family and you ask them what their outcome is and they say, oh, we're here to build community and build neighbors. So we put on this egg hunt and a bouncy cast and all this. The challenge is I go with my family, I participate, it's fun, it's entertaining, but they didn't actually achieve their outcome because in no way did they facilitate my experience with neighbors or creating community. And I'm not that outgoing, so we do the activities and have fun. So if they were to ask me, did you connect with other people in this community? I would, I, I would say no. But they would look and say, oh, we had 500 people uh, at this event. What a great opportunity and we must be meeting our outcomes. And, and that's where I kind of see that you might have that participant that goes to a fitness class, comes in, does their bike and leaves and connects with no one. And, and that's fine. And they may not be interested in that. But we may also have that person that does the same thing, looking for that connectivity. An instructor or the environment doesn't facilitate it right away and they leave. And then we don't know why they leave. And oftentimes it's because, well, I didn't feel like I belonged or, you know, I was hoping to meet some people. I didn't, so I'm not coming back. We don't intentionally measure that. And, and I think that's really important because if you look at a lot of departmental mission, vision, values and institutional, it talks about that healthy connections and, you know, and, and that connection to the institution and sustainable, healthy relationships moving forward. And so that's where I kind of ask that question. It's so important, but we don't ask that. And we, and we all have those stories of where that happened. Mm -hmm. But how intentional are we as that as an outcome so that we're training staff to do that, we're, we're, we're measuring it so that when we, you know, a, a good example is uh, on a, a previous podcast some, or a webinar, someone had mentioned about uh, putting on one day events. Well, one day events might get the participation numbers, but to actually reach any sustainable outcome of sustainable activity and all that. And, and I don't have the answer to that, but I don't think many of us do because we don't actually measure that. We ask, and it comes back to, we ask about satisfaction. Were you satisfied with the event? Sure. Mm -hmm. Was that your outcome that I was satisfied? No. Right. And so that intentionality, what if that looks like social connectivity, well-being, belonging, that's an important assessment. And I, and I don't, I don't know we've gotten even close to being able to articulate that in a way and measure it in a way that, you know, we can say, this is how you do it. This is how you do it effectively. And this is how you tell the story to your department and institution. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. I'm curious. So um, obviously that's very well thought through. Have you, um, have you started to develop any sort of a assessment uh, along those lines for, for your unit? So the way I've always looked at it is, you know, when I think of connectivity and that belongingness is that belonging is actually dependent of the individual the individual gets to decide whether they belong and we often don't program that way we program for okay here's basketball so we program for basketball players as opposed to we are programming for people playing basketball totally different framework totally different way you're going to approach things. and so we make those assumptions that when someone comes into our basketball program they understand basketball they get it and so we create a program that creates a culture for basketball players but we don't, and then we make those assumptions. So part of what I like to, to look at is, you know, when I think of belonging, the three tenets I use is how are people being invited? How are they being welcomed? And how are they being included in that activity? Whatever that activity looks like. And, and so when those three things are measured, then that sense of belonging say, well, yes, I, and again, it's hard because, you know, I see in the chat, it is hard because each individual says, I belong or I didn't, or what could we have done to help you belong better? And that's going to be so dependent on, on the person's lived experience. And then when you start getting into marginalizations, that's even harder, right? Because now you have intersectionalities, you know, and so it gets so challenging. But, and I think that's why we don't do it. It's so hard, right? We think, well, how do I do that? But I think if we put some intentionality behind it and start thinking and asking those basic questions. I really love the previous points about simple surveys that say, 
you know, even if it is by participating in this basketball intramural program, did you feel more connected to your fellow students? Yes, or, you know, and is that a scale to the institution, the campus rec as a whole? You know, did you meet individuals? Like, was that, you know, is, is an outcome of social connectivity then saying, how many people did you meet as a result of playing basketball in our programs? And, and maybe that's drop-in too, right? We always talk about our, you know, registered programs. What about drop-in opportunities? Yeah, I met tons of people just going to the gym, right? And then when you start measuring that, and, and I don't know if I've ever seen that, anybody ask that question. When you start measuring that, then you can start connecting those dots going, wow, look, and then you start asking, well, how did that happen? And, and you start seeing, did we facilitate that? Was it just by the person's own motivation? And then we say, oh, well, when we put X, Y, and Z in place, it really helped for that connectivity. So I was at the University of Waterloo where we created, a, it was, you know, 15 years ago, but we created a free agent program where basically we facilitated their whole experience. We put them on a team of other free agents. The staff worked really hard to create schedules and all that so they could participate. And we, we would have, like, in, in a basketball program of 140 teams, 20 of those would be individual teams. And those individual teams were just individuals. Maybe they had a friend or two, but not enough to make their own team. We had over, like, 1,500 individual participants that would not have played otherwise. So what are we doing to facilitate that? that sense of belonging when when they don't feel like they belong and I couldn't belong in the basketball in the murals if I don't have a team or if I don't have people to play with so what are we doing intentionally to facilitate that as well yeah that's a that's good stuff Mark thanks for sharing that I'll I guess I'll add a thought on top of that in that um, in those assessments of programs events annual you know satisfaction surveys it makes me think that in addition to asking those questions of did you get connected, do you, have, do you feel a sense of belonging, all that stuff, I think it's also important um, to understand not what made people feel connected, but why didn't they feel connected? Why didn't you feel comfortable coming into the rec center? Um, why didn't you feel comfortable signing up for, for a sport? Because I think that that also exposes areas for improvement, you know, within programming. So thanks for all those comments. That's good stuff. Yeah, I wanted to add right quick on that. Um, I went to the virtual, I don't know if y'all heard uh, the assessment conference from New England College, um, where they talk about uh, two things that I got from basically what Mark was saying was one implementation fidelity of assessment of how you're getting to do that program or assessment of the steps that you did to create that program and make sure it's all in order or it's incorrect. Um, and then assessing the outcomes to make sure that all your ducks in a row, uh, your T's uh, cross I's dotted. And I think we uh, get so uh, focused on, like you said, as we all were saying, the outcomes based, the after thought, but are we, um, yeah, are we actually assessing the process itself uh, to make sure it's working? And so I think implementation fidelity is a huge thing that, well, it's just not us, but all um, student affairs programs need to consider. Um, and then in regards to that, um, something I'm starting to figure out is actually reading the room or reading the student body uh, where I think we're, we're figuring this out in terms of sense of belonging on are, are our programs becoming too static or are stable where we need to think about alternative programming? Because we think, okay, we're just going to offer a basketball, we're going to offer intramurals, but we're starting to see participation down. Are we actually focusing on this alternative concept and programming um, that gets the other side engaged or other groups or pockets of students engaged? Because I think we try to do too, a little too much traditional and we need to probably read the room or read the environment that some of our students are not doing that, especially if they're not traditional. They may not want to uh, play uh, 40 minutes of basketball, 20 minutes a half. You know, maybe they need to do something else. And with our intramural program, we tried that and it started, it looks like it, it took out, it took off pretty well um, since we did more, as y'all say, you know, day in events. So, we did a drop-in event in partnership with Open Rec and did capture the flag. Um, we did drop-in events um, where we were we were going to do a slam dunk contest, 
But just simple like drop-in events on where we get more participation for day-in events. Maybe students like that instead of the typical traditional programming. I mean, I mean, for instance, group fitness is day-in um, events or drop-in events. So just something to, that I, I took out of that. Cool. Uh, we can move on to, yes, using assessment practices to advancing equity uh, through recreation. I think April sent me an email and talking about that and she wanted to contribute. Do you have anything, April, in regards to it? Yeah, I do. Um, is it, would it be possible to share my screen really quick? Uh, sh sure. I don't, I don't know, I don't if, know if Nursa, <laughs> if it lets you I don't know if nurse, anyone from Nurse will be able to do that. Oh, yeah. I think you just got made a co-host. Okay, so. perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, give me one second. Okay, I got it. Can you all see? Okay, so um, I threw this together. I realized, like, as I'm talking to you all through this, that all of our stuff is behind, like, an FSU um, login wall and I don't know why everything is so private. So last night when, um, after I talked to Chris about talking about some of these items um, to this group, I was like, oh man, I gotta pull all this down off our wall. So I made this PDF. Um, it's not anywhere that I can send you a link, but again, I'll send it to Christian and the Jasons after this so that they can send it out in an email somehow. We'll figure out how to do that. Um, but I wanted to, uh, just be able to get this out. We worked um, really quickly in our office um, in the past couple of weeks to put together a almost like a best practices um, from many different resources about how to ask inclusive demographic items, especially on questionnaires, or surveys, um, because there's a lot of information out there. And these are ways that in our office, um, we their best practices for us. Um, so we threw them together for our division and I'm very happy to share this out. But just to go through a couple of them, um, we are labeling it critical assessment. We do talk about critical assessment theory in the guide and how important that is. If any of you are also um, on the student affairs assessment leaders listserv, um, that is a great listserv to be on if you, I assume that Christian is on it if you went to the assessment conference. Um, but if you can get on there, a lot of good resources and information. They put, it a, they put out a very strong Black Lives Matter statement and also included a bunch of the critical assessment theory practices that you see here in white papers. Um, so again, great resources here and I'll send this to you all. Um, when we did this, we included that and then we started talking about how to basically create inclusive demographic items and the things that you need to think about as you're going through and creating them, as well as all of our resources that we use to do this. Um, a lot of it is FSU specific, but I think that there's a lot that you can get from this and just ignore the FSU specificity. Um, we talk about confidential versus anonymous, which most of you are probably familiar with. We do talk about um, just points to think about when developing inclusive items, especially for some of those questions that are a little bit harder to put together sometimes. Um, we talk about the importance of sequencing in demographic items. Um, and then we go through and we just list like, here are sample items and sample questions that you might consider using and here's where we pull them from um, in our office. Um, the resources that we use, some of them are from FSU, but a lot of them are not and or could be adaptable if you are looking for ways to ask um, inclusive items. So um, all of the topics that you see here and more on race ethnicity. And if there are questions about demographics or the way that we have asked them um, of inclusive demographic questions on our items at FSU in the past um, and you don't see them on here, feel free to reach out to me about them. But I will get this to the chairs of this committee to send you guys. Oh, any questions while I have it up from anybody? Okay. Whoops. Thanks for sharing that, April. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, yeah, I appreciate that a lot, April. Uh, yeah, I just sent it to Stephanie, but essentially, if anyone um, is doing, doing assessment or, any, or for any, you know, student affairs professional, um, Sal is, yeah, definitely a great resource. I was introduced to it um, when I first got into this, this role here. Um, they do do provide a lot of good assessment resources. Uh, a lot of times it's just, you know, people from entry level to PhD, been doing this for a long time. Um, they ask questions on certain assessment, on surveys and things of that nature, but it's a great resource. They do structure conversations. They share information on uh, any assessment conferences coming up and any documents that they uh, want to provide. Um, some of the blogs on there are pretty good. So yeah, if you want to just go on, um, you can look for SAL, S-A-A-L, uh, Student Affairs Assessment Leaders. You can sign up for a membership, no different than um, any other membership. I think it's free of charge, there's no cost to it, and they just add you to listserv. Um, they're actually trying to grow that base too. So if y'all are interested, yeah, feel free to look it up or I can give you more information on that, but great resource uh, for that. Um, no, we're kind of short on time, um, but I wanted to get a feel from anyone out there. Um, assessment of marginalized groups within recreation. So this is something I was actually working on um, as my summer project this uh, this summer. And one of the things that I figured out through, uh, you know, obviously, you know, data and analysis um, is that we have a participation issue um, in terms of engaging marginalized groups such as Black, um, Hispanic, Latinx, um, and then our Asian uh, students, and is definitely our uh, specific Islander, uh, Filipino, um, those uh, Native American group. We're figuring out that they are heavily not participating or not um, engaging in recreation more so than our white Caucasian students. And it's almost to the tune of like, for every, I'll say, our white students are participating almost just as much as three times more than all the other groups. Uh, and then I'm, I'm even looking at a micro level and that is consistently um, and one, you know, for, for me, I want to engage, you know, and be inclusive as we all would like to do. But I wanted to see on how you guys or if anyone out there is assessing any groups like that, are they seeing a pattern and what steps are they looking towards that? So I guess I'll kick it off. Um, incredibly complex topic. And I, I, I think obviously there's a lot of different things connected to it. Um, but I think one of the areas that, that we're looking to start as a, as a department is um, looking internally first. So for example, um, the, our division of student affairs is, is looking at a number of different initiatives and they've kicked off a task force to, to focus on um, you know not just marginalized groups but also related to the the other topic Chris that we have posted up here is you know uh, advancing equity through recreation and, and of course campus-wide um, we have the same issue you know um, our participation numbers uh, across the board um, in marginalized groups, um, you know, particularly black students is very, very low. Um, and so we need to understand uh, through an internal audit really of why that may be. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's, it's an, obviously it's an important time for us to, to be doing this, but um, I think we need to just look at ourselves first, you know, so I guess one example um, is like our entire staff is just not diverse. We're all, you know, we're an entire white staff. Now, one could argue that, you know, the profession of campus recreation isn't a very diverse profession to begin with, but um, there's so many different things I think that, that we need to look at in this profession that if we're going to contribute to um, 
a campus community that's dedicated to, um, you know, not just supporting diverse and inclusive environments, but actually, you know, living it and breathing it. So um, I, I don't have any necessary, uh, you know, tactics, if you will, but I can tell you that, that it's, it's, we're making steps right now as a unit, um, as a division to, you know, to really focus in on that. So um, I'm glad we're spending time talking about this because I, I think that we as a profession, um, it, it, it's, I feel that it's, it's especially challenging just because we are not um, by and large a, a very diverse, um, you know, uh, arena. I'll add in quickly that I think it's really important for us to disaggregate our data. So a lot of times from an assessment perspective, we get all of our data and we go, oh, wow, diversity. People are participating in our programs. But when we really disaggregate that and look at who those underrepresented populations are, we've had practical success. And I'll use our outdoor program, for example, of looking at that data and then reaching out to those specific student groups on campus that represent those, um, those marginalized groups, right? So working with, um, our outdoor program, we go to our international students office and create custom trips. And we've worked with our black graduate student uh, group on campus to uh, create custom trips for them. So that's just one example of going to those groups specifically after disaggregating the data and doing something very practical. Instead of saying, where do we start? We just go to that group and say, hey, did you know we offer these programs and being very intentional about that. Um, but like somebody mentioned in the comment, that disaggregation is, is the starting point. So yeah, thanks, April. Mark, you had anything to chime in? So you raise your yeah, hand. and I'll try to keep it quick, but I think that the issue is uh, we're also, as a profession, really good at programming at. Um, and we need to do more co-created experiences for any group feeling like they don't belong in our programs and services. I worked with their, our Indigenous Resource Center on campus, and it took about uh, almost a year of connecting and trying to have conversations before we even built a relationship and trust to build a true collaboration and it's meeting the students where they're at and again it's coming back to how are they being invited in that space staff is a great a great part of that if if i'm walking by the center and i don't see people that look like me uh, or feel like they know my interests then i don't i don't even feel like i'm invited right away um, and so we, and we do a good job of putting out information, join this, here's the cost, but we don't talk about, you know, is this being presented in a way that's meaningful to them where they feel like, okay, yes, I feel like as an Aboriginal or Indigenous uh, student that I'm welcome and invited into this space. And then once they're in this space, how are we welcoming them? And that's, that's from their, their experience within the programs, from walking around the facilities, imagery, staff, all that jazz. And then it comes down to then how are they being included? I can walk around our facility and feel welcome, but if there's not opportunities that are meaningful to me, someone said like, are we offering the activities and sports? And how are they co-creating that experience? Oftentimes we go, okay, let's run a cricket league. And so we'll put it out there as opposed to saying, let's get those students that want to participate in cricket and create an, a, an opportunity and a system that works for them, as opposed to, no, we run intramurals, so let's run a cricket intramural, this is a system. Well, that may not work, but when we're not including them in that process, we become, you know, people that just say, well, they're not coming, I don't know why, and they need to be, you know, it, it's a lot larger than that, but it's systemic. It, it's not just staffing. It's not just our facility. It's a whole way in which we look at how are these students feeling invited, welcome, and included in our opportunities so that that's where they feel like, I belong here. The other key thing is where do they belong currently? Because oftentimes our relationships with students and belonging aren't with the students. A lot of our students feel like, I love Campus Rec, I belong here. But oftentimes it's just with a friend. I come because my friend brought me. So how do we create those relationships that maybe, the, and this is what we learned, the students can feel belonging to us, but they feel belonging to the, to the Indigenous Student Resource Center. So we made them co-collaborators of our, of our processes and that so that they were the ones creating that sense of belonging and, and helped facilitate that experience rather than us trying to know, belong with us. They don't need to belong with us. Their outcome is that they, and hopefully that transitions, but if they're finding that comfort there, then help them be co-creators of that experience as well and bringing them along. So a lot of collaborations and question asking is necessary. Great point, thank you so much. I that's, I think more, more so as 
because we are actually uh, focusing a little more on how to uh, do assessment plans uh, and create, provide that culture assessment, um, look more towards uh, not only, as we've talked about earlier, uh, integration of programs and how we're doing it, but also how we're meeting a mark with those most students. So uh, that, I think we're pretty much that's done on time. Um, I'd like to thank all of you guys that have participated, um, whether you viewed or contributed. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to the Jasons, April, Stephanie, um, all, all the people who uh, participated in this. So um, if you guys want to provide any more chat, feel free to email each other for, uh, and keep the conversation going. But I think with that, I think that is all. Y'all have a good one. Stay safe. Please stay safe. It's, it's, it's crazy out there, but please stay safe. So take care and y'all have a good day. Bye, everyone.